good evening, everyone, and welcome back to the Freedom School Lecture Series. And I'm really honored to introduce two of my colleagues from Georgia State University for this very, very exciting session entitled Race, Policing, and Disability. And we always want to thank our colleagues at Auburn Avenue Research Library for their phenomenal partnership and support. And you all did not tune in to, to hear me ramble on. And so I'm going to introduce again my colleagues. And first, I'm going to start with Ashley Salmon, who is uh, the research associate at the Center for Leadership and Disability with the School of Public Health at Georgia State University. In this role, Ashley supports the center's research and dissemination efforts. She has a BS in psychology and, and English and an MPH in biostatistics. And also my colleague Desmond Goss, who is a, a relatively recent graduate PhD in sociology from Georgia State in 2017, where he is now a lecturer and director of the critically acclaimed social justice certificate program. If you don't know about it, you need to look it up. He is, uh, his research and in teaching involves critical analyses of identity, lived experience and power at the intersection of race, gender and sexuality. His work is published in several edited volumes, including Sex Matters, and focus on social problems. His forthcoming book, Race and Masculinity in Gay Men's Pornography, Deconstructing the B Big Black Beast, which I'm very excited about, uh, which is coming out on Rutledge, will be published in 2021. Ladies and gentlemen, um, my colleagues and this wonderful panel, thank you all very much. Thank you. Uh, let me share my screen. Can y'all hear me? Ashley, can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you. Okay, gotcha. Just check. Okay. Um, so uh, before we start, let me say that you can access um, a text version of this lecture um, that includes a glossary of some of the terms that we'll use um, at the link provided here on the slide, and I've also copied it in the chat. Um, and thank you to the Auburn Avenue Research Library and to Drs. Lakita Bennett Bailey and Jonathan Gale in the Department of Africana Studies at Georgia State University for providing this opportunity for Ashley and I to participate in the Freedom School lecture series. Our objective for this lecture is to outline a relationship between race, disability, and policing, which is a relationship which is um, too often sidelined in discussions of white supremacist policing. To do this, we will employ a sociological perspective to discuss the importance of the body in the history of policing and the importance of policing in the control of the body. We will also employ a public health perspective to ground this rather abstract social historical orientation in the lived experiences of people of color with disabilities navigating the white supremacist police state. We conclude by contemplating both reform oriented and abolitionist frameworks of justice to address the oppression that is inherent to this relationship. So we begin, my slide's working. We start with the origins of policing. We can trace the origins of policing in the settler US to two parallel events, the emergence of the English Victorian middle class and transatlantic slavery. The English Victorian middle class begins really solidifying in the early 1800s. Um, its emergence is a consequence of new industries and careers that introduced a new tier of social economic status between the working class and the upper class, that is a middle class. Um, this change brought about a new culture of norms whose primary function was to distinguish the middle class from the upper and lower classes. Um, these norms included a public facing emphasis on purity, uh, an outcome of the newfound importance of a so-called private life um, and is best symbolized through emergent Victorian notions of sexual privacy. These norms of purity and privacy bordered the middle class from the upper class who were understood by middle-class Victorians as kind of polluted by decadence. Um, however, these norms also included new restraints on the activities of the lower class, um, which were funneled through organizations designed to maintain social order through violence and then enshrined into the law. 
active between the mid 1700s to the early 1800s, um, the Bow Street Runners were the first organized police force in the industrializing world. However, their presence was comparatively small, um, confined mostly to retrieving stolen items on behalf of private citizens for reward. Um, on this slide, I've included a black and white photo of four uniformed Bow Street Runners, each facing the camera, one mounted on horseback. But the introduction of new legal structures for controlling the lower class provided an opportunity to expand state control considerably. For example, the Metropolitan Police Act of 1829, which created a national police force that enveloped the Bow Street Runners, was instilled during legislative movement to pass laws which explicitly and at times intentionally disproportionately impacted the lower classes. One such law includes the Vagrancy Act of 1834, which established the criminal concept of loitering in the Western world. Um, on this slide, I've included a photo of an antique sign attached to a brick wall in an English community that reads, notice to all vagabonds found lodging, loitering, or begging within this hamlet will be taken up and dealt with as the law directs. In fact, the Metropolitan Police recruited from the lower classes to thwart accusations of classism. Um, doing so also provided Metropolitan Police with insider intelligence. And these are tactics still in use by law enforcement and military organizations around the world today. The Victorian police structure was replicated in the Northern US states as night watches. Um, similarly, policing lower class communities in the context of urbanization and industrialization. In the Southern states, however, the origins of policing stem from the slave patrols, which date back to the 1700s in the Carolina colonies. Patrollers were tasked with re-abducting fugitive escapees, um, terrorizing enslaved communities to prevent insurrection, and punishing enslaved persons who, quote, misbehaved. Each was required to swear an oath I do swear that I will, as searcher for guns, swords, and other weapons among the slaves in my district, faithfully and as privately as I can, discharge the trust reposed in me as the law directs to the best of my power, so help me God. After the Civil War, the structures, practices, and personnel of Northern Night Watchers and Southern Slave Patrols merged and expanded to create the first modernized police departments in the US. On this slide, I've included a photo demonstrating the similar similarities between a silver slave patroller badge, which reads runaway slave patrol, um, and a golden sheriff's badge, which reads Los Angeles County Sheriff. Both items are metallic, star-shaped, and engraved. So this social historical analysis of the origins of policing in the US demonstrates that policing has always been about controlling folks who embody differences that challenge and inspire nonconformity. And the US settler state continues to use policing to border over empowered communities by indicating which bodies are appropriate for state sanctioned violence and therefore as a result, which bodies are appropriate. This is demonstrated in the state facilitated institutionalization of people with disabilities. The first such institution was established by Quakers in Philadelphia who converted the basement of a hospital into what was essentially a small prison, complete with shackles that tethered inmates to the wall. Institutionalization grew with state populations and like policing was increasingly understood and operated as a fundamental social control apparatus of the state. Disability justice advocates urge us to conceptualize these institutions as carceral facilities because like prisons and jails, they work to diminish uh, identity and autonomy as a function of confining undesirables to state administration. And historically, the administration of institution that confine folks convicted of crimes and those that confine folks with disabilities have overlapped considerably. On this slide, I've included a photo of a sign reading Secure Psychiatric Facility Department of Corrections attached to a tall fence layered with coiled barbed wire. When the institutionalization of people with disabilities declined between the 1970s and the 1990s, folks who would have been warehoused by institutions in previous decades were now unhoused. 
and unhoused status coupled with disability provided an inroad to warehousing by jails and prisons. For example, one third of the 10,000 inmates in the Cook County Jail in Chicago have a diagnosed psychiatric illness, which makes this institution one of the largest psychiatric facilities in the nation. Moreover, most of these individuals have been jailed for so-called crimes of survival, such as stealing small quantities of food or breaking and entering for a safer place to sleep. Jamichael Mitchell was a 24-year-old African-American living with schizophrenia and bipolar disorder. He was arrested for stealing a Snickers bar, a Mountain Dew, and a zebra cake. His bail was set to $3,000, which his family could not afford to pay. While jailed, officers routinely denied Mitchell access to basic necessities like socks, underwear, a blanket, a pillow, or bed sheets. Mitchell lost 38 pounds. Um, he refused to eat or take medication. A judge twice ordered Mitchell to be moved to a mental health facility, but there were no beds available. On August 15th, 2019, after 101 days in jail awaiting trial, uh, Mitchell was found dead in his cell. Inmates witnessed officers beat and abuse Mitchell on multiple occasions. According to one inmate, officers treated Mitchell like a, quote, circus animal. However, security footage from the jail was mysteriously erased. So over and over, we reveal these demonstrations of the relationship between class, race, disability, and policing. Now, to really understand and appreciate this relationship at its core, we must examine the social construction of disability from the processes through which social structures disable to the instances in which re resultant disabilities are criminalized by the criminal justice system. Disability is socially constructed in three ways. First, disability is constructed by social conditions. In other words, white supremacy, patriarchy, and capitalism each control through a violence that is inherently disabling, especially where these structures overlap. This violence is evident in the lead poisoning of Flint, Michigan, and the cancer rates along the Mississippi River Delta home to one of the highest concentrations of petrochemical factories in the world, in the genetic inheritances of chemical and nuclear warfare, in the intergenerational trauma of slavery, genocide, and poverty, and in so many other instances of community and environmental degradation. On this slide, I've included a photo of a mass protest march through a downtown district. In the, far, in the foreground, a protester chants and holds a sign reading, from Standing Rock to Flint to Newark, water is life. Second, disability is constructed by the cultural presumption that a so-called normal or ideal body exists because it legitimizes the creation of a world made exclusively for such a body. This body meets unreasonable expectations of productivity. Its cells never wear with time. It's never subject to accident. Thus, it is a body that simply cannot exist. Nevertheless, a world made for this so-called normal body enables bodies that approximate its ideal, while disabling bodies that don't. Third, disability is constructed by the prohibition of adequate and equitable resource distribution across communities. Hypocritically, the state supports this ideal body continuously, yet this support is almost never designated as help. It is freely offered to enable bodies and is therefore taken for granted and rarely scrutinized. Such support includes air traffic control, highway construction, tax deductions for marriage, and countless other means of subsidizing, read enabling, attitudes and behaviors encouraged and expected by ideal bodies by the settler state. On this slide, I've included a stylized image of four human figures, each with a different disability, navigating a world made for people without disabilities with the support of assistant devices such as prosthetic limbs. Now, we can use this framework to understand the violence that is characteristic of interactions between the criminal justice system and lower income non-white folks with disabilities. For example, research indicates that incarceration catalyzes physical and psychiatric disability through the disabling violence of its social conditions, through its presumption of a universal ideal body, and perhaps most significantly, 
through its prohibition of adequate research distribution to inmates. And the US legal system has repeatedly justified the use of deadly force by police officers when encountering non-white individuals who are experiencing mental health crises, even when the individual does not present a threat to officer safety. In contrast, police interactions with middle and upper income white folks experiencing mental health crises often involve de-escalation techniques, even when the individual presents a threat to officer safety. Now, it is problematic to equate mass violence and mental illness. However, it is also problematic to believe that individuals who enact mass violence are experiencing healthful mental states. As such, there are several instances in which police officers provided a basic level of care to white mass shooters that is routinely denied to people of color in crisis, who often pose a threat of harm only to themselves, if anyone. After killing nine people at a church in South Carolina, the police who captured self-proclaimed white supremacist Dylan Roof brought him a meal from Burger King. Four years later, Jamichael Mitchell, jailed for stealing snacks, would die in his cell, starved, abused, and alone. Overall, data suggests that race, disability, and social economic status are significant variables for predicting the outcome of police interactions, such that the likelihood of aggressive police tactics that result in harm or even death is higher for non-white people with disabilities. This phenomenon is a logical extension of cumulative disadvantage, which refers to the overrepresentation of people of color, especially Black, Native, and Latinx folks, folks surviving poverty, folks with less formal education, and people with disabilities at every interval of the criminal justice system, including stops, arrests, incarceration, and use of deadly force. And cumulative disadvantage is an outcome of the ways in which the criminal justice system works as an agent of terror and control in these communities through, for example, the school to prison pipeline, exaggerated police surveillance, the war on drugs, mandatory sentencing, and every other aspect of the tough on crime discourse. Altogether, these and related processes result in a 50% chance of incarceration for black men who do not have a high school diploma, which is more than double the percent chance of incarceration for white men with the same level of formal education. Moreover, unarmed people of color are twice as likely to be murdered by the police during interactions than unarmed whites. Of course, the chances of harm by police increase when the individual is a person with, dis with a disability. A major factor in this increase is the compliance culture of policing, wherein police expect people to immediately respond and comply to their requests uh, for changes in behavior and attitude that indicate obedience and subordination, even when they have not been vested with the legal authority to do so. On this slide, I have included a photo of a police officer graduation. The photo includes at least 100 officers, each in the same dark uniform, raising their right hand, which is inside a white glove. Officers are trained to react with force when this expectation for compliance is unsatisfied and to increase force with every interval between an unsatisfied expectation. And such force is justified by the social, cultural, and political norms of white supremacy and ableism that predate and frame these interactions. For example, there have been multiple instances in which Black folks who are deaf have been accosted by police for not following orders when those orders simply were not heard and multiple instances where Black folks who use devices such as wheelchairs um, to support their mobility have been accosted by police simply because they could not move as fast as officers expected or demanded. In a study of interactions between youth with intellectual disabilities and the police, interviewees frequently provided narratives that demonstrate the problems of compliance culture. One participant reports, Police always handcuff me and put me in the police van. Police do not listen to me and give me attitude. This isn't because people don't understand me, it's because they are mean. They shout when you're not listening. They talk over you. They say, shut up and be quiet. Another participant states, the police just shoved the paperwork in my face. They told me I needed to go to court at this time. When I tried to communicate with the police, 
It was too hard and they didn't tell me much about the procedure. It would have been better if police had explained it to me. I found it hard to understand what was going on. No one helped me. And add this, this quote from a social worker in the same study. When he first saw the police, he instinctively gets on to the fence to leave. The police then pull him down. The way he responds to the police was probably inappropriate. And he kept saying, all I want to do is get up and play my basketball because that's his coping mechanism. And they wouldn't let him up. They just push him harder down and he just responds accordingly and the whole thing escalates. However, research suggests that police officers may be just as likely to victimize individuals who comply. For example, the sociologist Victor Rios spent time living among young Black and Latino men in a low-income community. Rios observed multiple interactions between these men and the police to find that they were exposed to police violence even when they complied with officer demands for changes in attitude and behaviors. In one instance, a resident was instructed by officers to pull up his sagging pants, and when he reached down to do so, officers reacted as though the young man's movements implied a potential threat to officer safety. Thus, as aforementioned, racial minoritization and disability are identity formations through which the state controls and suppresses via police violence to ensure the social, cultural, political, and economic supremacy of the ideal body, middle and upper class whites without disabilities. The inverse of this social psychological wage of able-bodiedness is the terrorization of people with disabilities by the criminal justice system. Statistical modeling predicts that 55%, more than half, of Black folks with disabilities will be arrested by age 28. One third of all persons murdered by the police were people with disabilities, and one third of all imprisoned folks are people with disabilities, though people with disabilities comprise only one fifth of the US population. On this slide, I've included an illustrated image of six people, each holding a briefcase, including two men of color, one wearing a tequila, an older white woman, a woman in hijab, um, a middle-aged white man and a white man in a wheelchair. Each figure looks up at a box above their heads. Each box has an X inside, except for the box above the middle-aged white man, which has a check mark. So the intersection of race and disability is critical for understanding state violence. On this slide, I've included an image that illustrates intersectionality using a stick figure surrounded by arrows pointing to it. Each arrow has a different label, including race, education, sexuality, ability, age, gender, ethnicity, culture, language, and class. Black folks in the US are more likely to live with chronic health conditions, more likely to face significant obstacles to adequate mental health services, and less likely to have a disability diagnosed by a medical practitioner than US whites. These barriers to well being have been constructed by the state through centuries of resource deprivation, campaigns of disempowerment, and structural violence, which have diminished the health outcomes of Black and Native folks in every era of the settler US. Thus again, we can appreciate how the state constructs racially minoritized disability and then oppresses it through mechanisms like criminalization. Let's turn now to my colleague Ashley for a public health and data science perspective. Thank you, Dr. Goss. Um, so yes, like uh, this, this intersectionality framework that you just mentioned um, allows us to determine factors that may lead to higher arrest for this population. So as Dr. Goss explained, um, we can use intersectionality as a means to better understand the conditions of people and the many factors that impact their well-being, specifically as it relates to oppression and identity development. So as Kimberly Crenshaw asserted in her 1991 manuscript uh, entitled Mapping the Margins, Intersectionality, Identity Politics and Violence Against Women of Color, quote, the problem with identity politics is not that it fails to transcend difference as some critics charge, but rather the opposite, that it frequently conflates or ignores intragroup differences. So next slide here, um, we have, uh, an article by Eric J. McCauley um, entitled The Cumulative Probability of Rest by Age 28. Um, 
age 28 years in the United States by disability status, race, ethnicity, and gender. Um, it was released in 2017, and um, I'll describe some of the findings. Um, so estimate, estimates just demonstrated that those with disabilities have a higher cumulative probability of arrest than those without. Furthermore, the risk was disproportionately spread across races and ethnicities, with Blacks with disabilities experiencing the highest cumulative probability of arrest, and Whites without disabilities experiencing the lowest. So I'll continue to share some of the findings from the paper. Um, so overall, males had higher cumulative probabilities of arrest than females. Uh, for all racial groups, all racial and ethnic groups across both genders, the cumulative, the cumulative probability of arrest was higher for those with disabilities than for those without. So regardless of being male or female, if you had a disability, you had a higher prob a cumulative probability of arrest. For whites, however, the cumulative probability of arrest stayed the same across both genders. Um, so those whites with disabilities um, had 11 point higher prox uh, cumulative probability of arrest for both uh, males and females. So for the white group, there was no gender difference, but again, having a disability um, yielded a higher cumulative probability of arrest. For Blacks, however, the disability gap was larger among females than males. So there were more females with disabilities in the sample um, than male, Black males with disabilities. However, the total cumulative probability of arrest was higher for Black males with and without disabilities than for Black females with and without disabilities. So that shows us that there's no, there's no in this sample anyway, there's no difference um, in arrest for Black males and Black females. Um, regardless of ability, disability or ability. So for Hispanics, the disability gap was larger among males than females. So there was more males in, uh, with uh, male Hispanics with disabilities than females in this, in this particular sample. Um, so what's important for this uh, paper uh, to note is that the disability difference is significant for each gender based racial ethnic group, except for blacks. So when we think about this intersectionality framework, um, and I know a lot of us are probably familiar with Kimberly Crenshaw and um, the Say Her Name. You know, there's not a, a difference uh, between Black males and Black females um, with the probability of arrest by the age 28. Um, so for all racial and ethnic groups, however, cognitive and emotional disabilities were the most common. So I think, you know, we tend to think about disability and the first thing that comes to mind is, you know, someone in a wheelchair, perhaps, you know. Um, so uh, in this sample, we have 40% of whites, 48% of blacks, and 49% of Hispanics having an emotional disability, and 44% of whites, 50% of blacks, and 40% of Hispanics having a cognitive disability. So for all groups, the least common disability uh, was physical. So here we have um, two graphs. Uh, so these are two graphs depicting uh, the age-specific probability of arrest for A, people without disabilities, and B, people with disabilities. And this comes from the National Longitudinal Survey of Youth, um, 1997. Uh, it all takes place in the United States. Um, and the, the span is from 1997 to 2014. And here we have trend lines uh, for whites, blacks, and Hispanics. Um, and here we have both graphs that peak between ages 17 and 19. So graph A, which is people without disabilities, shows three similar trend lines for whites, blacks, and Hispanics, with blacks maintaining a higher probability across ages. Graph B, uh, people with disabilities, shows three less similar trends for whites, blacks, and Hispanics, with blacks maintaining a large gap in probability across age compared to graph, um, uh, graph A, this previous graph. Um, and the spike at 17 and 19, that probability just spikes to the top for um, Black people with disabilities. And so here in the next slide, um, I think the paper does a really good job of concluding the findings of the paper. And I'll just read this for you. So the experience of arrest for those with disabilities was higher than expected. Police officers should understand how disabilities may affect compliance and other behaviors. And likewise, how implicit bias and structural racism may affect reactions and actions of officers and the systems they work within 
with, within in ways that create inequities. So I, I believe this paper did a wonderful job using data to create a narrative on disparities and how we might uh, reimagine policing, equity, and justice. So here I have a question. Um, so what does it mean to have multiple intersecting identities? Uh, so here's a, uh, some findings from a paper. Well, not necessarily findings, but here's some, some points from a paper that I'd like to, to, um, to, uh, to pull on. Um, from, the paper is entitled Disability Identity and Allyship in Rehabilitation Psychology, Sit, Stand, Sign, and Show Up. It was released in 2018. Um, the authors are Forber, Pratt, Mueller, and Andrews. Um, and um, I believe um, all, if not maybe just one of them have, uh, were self-identified self as having a disability. Um, so the answer to, to my question um, from former Pat Mueller and Andrews is um, multiple intersecting identities equals a compounded form of oppression. So I'll use myself, for example, um, use myself as an example here. So I'm a black queer woman. Um, so these identities intersect and they, def they affect the way I navigate the world and they affect the way that people perceive me. So let's use this example here on the slide. Um, so if a person is black, you know, let's consider a person who might be black or another other person of color um, who has a disability or a perceived disability, and then a co-occurring mental health concern or perhaps more than one disability. Just imagine how they might navigate in the world and how the world might perceive them. So I'm just gonna read a quote from the paper. Um, it states, there are many kinds, there are many different kinds of disabilities, impairments, and ways of being represented in the disability community. Each with its own nuances, including identity cultures of the sub-disabled. There are also important intersectional identities that are often not considered in discussions already made complex by thinking about disability itself. Individuals who experience racism, homophobia, transphobia, religious persecution, or any combination thereof, in addition to ableism, experience a compounded form of oppression that is often not considered in designing tools, practices, and research agendas. The experience of this compounded form of oppression is intersectionality. So now let's consider or explore the intersection between mental health and intellectual and developmental disabilities. So here I have some findings um, from a couple of references that I don't have listed here, but um, feel free to reach out to me uh, if you need, if you're interested in these references um, or any else, any other references that are a part of this uh, presentation. So uh, these findings state that it is estimated that 30 to 60% of people with intellectual and developmental disabilities or IDD experience co-occurring mental illness. And that's a prevalence rate that nears seven times greater than those without IDD. And so that's, that's a huge disparity. So when we consider compliance in an interaction with an officer capable of using deadly force, this has the potential for disaster, especially as we repeatedly see how police handle mental health crises on the scene. So what might justice look like um, in the disability community? So here I have um, a photo from the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation. It's a comparison of equality versus equity using depictions of four family members. One person has a disability indicated by a wheelchair. One family member is very tall. You might perceive them as a father. Uh, one family member is average height. You might perceive uh, this person as the mother. One family member is short. This could be perceived as the little sibling. So the equality example shows all members attempting to ride the same size bike with two wheels and foot pedals, which excludes the person in the wheelchair, makes it uncomfortable and impractical for the tall and short family members, and leaves the average height family member at an advantage. The equity example shows different sized bikes accommodating the various heights of the family members with different capabilities for the person in the wheelchair, like hand pedals. So there are various ways to reimagine equity and justice in the disability space, uh, but I'll share three that I'm um, 
getting more familiar with. Uh, it's a learning process. So supported decision-making or SDM uh, is a process of, uh, the process of using trusted supporters to understand, make and communicate decisions to others as opposed to relying on people without disabilities, even guardians in some cases um, to make decisions for people with disabilities. So this enhances the quality of life for a person with a disability and could arguably interrupt the special education to prison pipeline, although that's a huge topic for another uh, conversation. Um, a next, another concept is cultural and linguistic competence or CLC, and that can be described as an individual's or organization's commitment to have the capacity to one, value diversity, two, conduct self-assessment, three, manage the dynamics of difference, four, acquire and institutionalize cultural knowledge, and five, adapt to diversity in the cultural context of communities they serve. And this includes people with disabilities. Um, and lastly, uh, I'll talk about Universal Design for Learning or UDL. UDL is a framework to improve and optimize teaching and learning for all people based on scientific insights into how, into how humans learn. So an example of UDL is the use of plain language. Um, this is tailoring your writing to a sixth to eighth grade reading level. Some factors that affect plain language and readability are um, word length or like number of syllables, a complex definitions and overall word count. UDL um, is not only beneficial to a person with an intellectual developmental disability by ensuring uh, those with an IDD have access to information, however, it increases access for many others who, for example, uh, may not have a higher education degree or those who may not be familiar with the jargon of a, of a specific discipline. So um, this has potential to increase access to information that may affect compliance um, and interactions with law enforcement. So that's all I have um, tonight. So I'll pass it back to Dr. Goss to close us out. Thank you, Ashley. Um, so what do we do? Right. Um, unfortunately, reformist approaches to addressing the inherent violence of policing racial minorities with disability ultimately work to reinforce social systems of oppression because they are liberalist rather than liberationist at the core. Um, in addition to seeking legal restitution um, and sensitivity training. A more recent reform approach involves alternatives to police as first responders. This approach routes calls that involve possible mental health crises to a response team of medical professionals, social workers, and or trained counselors. Um, this change is the result of demands from activists of color uh, with disabilities and their allies. Um, and is a welcome step in the movement to, um, uh, to divest from policing. However, it is still treatment of a symptom rather than cure of a cause. It is, it is a practical harm reduction, but can never be an end to the harm itself. Simply put, liberalism emphasizes repair that is fundamentally reactionary and individualistic. As such, it diverts energy, resources, and attention away from the structural, institutional, and cultural origins of oppression towards individuals, both those who have victimized and those who are victimized. In essence, reform treats the symptoms of oppression without addressing the causes. There are so many instances of liberalism's failures through history. In fact, we are currently reliving the failures of affirmative action, now rebranded as diversity, equity, and inclusion, or DEI, in the wake of the Black Lives Matter movement. Such instances are often moments of liberal inclusion where oppressive institutions seek really to diversify oppressors. This, for example, problematizes the celebration of Kamala Harris as the first black woman US vice president as Harris built her career using the tools of the criminal justice system and has been described as like any prosecutor, a cop with a law degree. On the slide, I've included a photo of Harris smiling, surrounded by sheriff deputies, wearing a uniform jacket labeled police, emblazoned with a police badge. Abolitionists like Angela Davis have written extensively about the role of prosecution in racialized mass incarcerations. 
which too often conceptualizes justice as high rates of conviction. This phenomenon is connected to the process of overcharging, whereby prosecutors threaten defendants with charges that carry mandatory sentences higher than would typically be expected of the criminal activity under indictment. This encourages defendants, especially those who uh, can't afford a highly resourced defense attorney, to accept plea deals, regardless of guilt or severity of the criminal offense. And critiques of liberal inclusion also problematize the celebration of liberals when Biden replaced Trump as the chief executive of a still colonized land, even as he reopened detention centers for migrant children, orders military airstrikes in Syria, and has, in my opinion, done a little more than Trump to protect and support racial minorities with disabilities who are disproportionately impacted by the lack of appropriate governmental response to the COVID-19 pandemic. Biden's pandemic response plan excludes what most radical health advocates argue is necessary for protecting and supporting marginalized communities, free, comprehensive, and accessible health care for all who need it. Liberal solutions to police victimization of people with disabilities have largely centered on increased sensitivity training and legal proceedings against offending officers or departments. A scientific analysis of 427 individual studies of sensitivity training involving more than 87,000 participants found that such training did not alter behaviors. In other words, Diminishing impl implicit bias through training is possible, but the link between implicit bias, such as the false belief that mental illness causes violence, and oppressive behavior, such as police brutality, is extraordinarily weak. People with disabilities have involved the courts in seeking restitution for police brutality under a federal civil rights statute, which allows citizens to sue the government when they have been deprived of rights guaranteed by the US Constitution or other federal statutes. However, these cases have mostly failed to provide restitution, as courts are unlikely to agree that this statute applies before and during arrests. More recent claims have attempted to bring about restitution under the Americans with Disabilities Act, or ADA, which requires government institutions like the police to provide reasonable accommodations for people with disabilities. However, courts often cite a legal precedent known as direct threat to limit the application of ADA in cases of police brutality. Here, courts argue that officers are not required to accommodate when they believe that doing so presents a threat to their own safety. In other words, courts often find that such accommodations are not, quote, reasonable. This idea is not new. The inadequacies of liberal movements for justice have been well documented by scholars and activists like W.E.B. Du Bois, who co-founded the NAACP after realizing the failures of legal emancipation of Black political participation and the college education of Black folks in bringing about an end to white supremacy. More than 100 years later, critical race scholar and legal theorist Derek Bell provided an explanation for the problem that Du Bois identified. Bell's concept of interest convergence argues that reforms are only allowed by an institution when such reforms are aligned with the goals of the institution itself. In other words, all liberalist reforms ultimately support the oppressive institution that such reforms claim to address. Political scientist Allison Howell argues for replacing the concept of militarization of the police with that of martial politics, as the former, quote, falsely presumes a peaceful liberal order that is encroached on by military values or institutions. Instead, Howell argues that interpreting police activity and culture through a framework of martial politics allows us to understand how the police have always been involved in producing white social and economic order through warlike relations with indigenous, racialized, disabled, and poor communities. Or perhaps more succinctly from scholar and poet, my personal hero, Audrey Lord, the master's tools will never dismantle the master's house. Liberation is liberalism's foil. 
It is the end of white supremacy, ableism, capitalism, patriarchy, militarism, and every other system of oppression. It is the freedom of communities to live by mutual support of one another. And liberation requires abolitionism. Abolition is the deconstruction of oppressive structures, institutions, and cultures to rebuild just communities in their place. Abolitionist perspectives on policing acknowledge the criminal justice system is not in need of reform because it is operating precisely how it was intended to. Therefore, for just communities to exist and thrive, the criminal justice system must be abolished. In practice, abolishing the criminal justice system involves transferring time, energy, resources, and attention away from the consequences of structural oppression, such as criminal activity, toward its origins, such as public education, universal health care, and housing and food security for all. And there is a place for all of us in the abolitionist movement. We can invest our time, our energy, our resources, and our attention in the abolitionist work already ongoing in our communities. We can do abolitionism in our everyday lives by participating in even the smallest expressions of mutual aid. And we can join others in our communities in calling for the end to jails, the end to prison, the end to the police, and all other aspects of the criminal justice system that disproportionately terrorize people of color with disabilities to rebuild a just community where all bodies can thrive. This means moving beyond abolishing the police to abolish the larger structures of white supremacy and ableism on which police violence relies. On this slide, I've included a photo of a mass protest march through a downtown district. In the foreground, a protester holds a sign reading, no justice, no peace, abolish the police. And that's all we have. Um, thank you for tuning in. We're happy to answer any questions or respond to any comments. All right. Um, that was amazing. So much to think about. And thank you, uh, Dr. Goss. So we, we will welcome questions and I'm sure they'll be pouring in shortly. And of course, I have uh, several questions. And I, I wanted to um, ask you, Ashley, so you, you talked about intersectionality. And of course, intersectionality is, is certainly something that um, intersects, so to speak, uh, your, both of your presentations. And as we think about in, intersectionality and, and being in, in African-American studies, soon to be Africana studies at Georgia State, I wanted to ask you, in terms of your own experience, research, and perspective, why and or how is intersectionality something with which many in the African-American community struggle? You know, what is centered at the expense of what? And, and where do we lose sight of these inter, intersections? And I wanted to give you a chance to, to think about that. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, and definitely one I'm sure everybody's thought about before, something I've definitely thought about before. Um, I do think there's this idea that we have to have a centralized message, that there can't be plurality of thought or plurality of like just lived experience, identity, um, but that's it's rooted in white supremacy, right? That we have to come correct, right? We have to come with all these, uh, everything kind of figured out and like we have to come with a general consensus, but like white society doesn't have a general consensus, do they? You know, there's queer, there's a queer sector of society. There's, there's the, the women's movement of society um, they don't all have to coexist as um, a, a, a single, a, a, you know, a monolith. Um, and I, I think that's a huge disadvantage when we can't reimagine what it looks like to be black and have multiple intersecting identities, you know? So I, I encourage people to, to um, look up Kimberly Crenshaw. Um, she, she really coined this term intersectionality um, and understand how intersectionality is really the thing that stops us from having a centralizing a class a class movement, right? We are more alike than we're different. Um, if 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 the white if the white person uh, middle class white person could could band with the the black middle class person, with, and we have very similar struggles, we could have a class a, a, 
the class-based um, revolution as opposed to this race kind of structure, you know? So um, uh, intersectionality really sheds a light on um, the intra-group differences that we tend to ignore. Thank you. Um, let's see. So uh, we have we have a couple of questions, but I know we had a, a hand raised here, and it looks like um, Ron Goss has his hand raised. And so um, I think what I want to ask you to do, Ron, is type your question in the Q&A, if you would. Um, I think that's how we're addressing these. Oh, okay, well, no, there you are. Okay, go ahead, Ron. Unmute yourself. Can you hear me now? We can. Okay, hi. Um, my question is for Dr. Goss, my first question, I've got several. Um, in, in his earlier talk, he made mention of someone being incarcerated for stealing a Snickers bar or something like that. So my, my question to him is, is there a dollar amount where incarceration is good or it's just no incarceration at all for stealing? I can't hear you. Sorry, good question, Ronald. That's my father, everybody. Yeah, I, I could um, imagine, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, it depends on who you ask. If you're asking me as someone inter interested in intersectional um, social justice, who is an abolitionist, I would say all incarceration is bad. Um, there is no dollar amount at which uh, incarceration should be justified. I stressed um, the stealing of the snacks just to emphasize how small of a crime um, that Jamichael had been in prison for compared to his punishment, which was, which exceed cruel and unusual. I mean, he was denied even basic care, um, um, uh, which is made even more impactful given that he was facing mental health crises, right? Which were surely exacerbated by the stress of um, incarceration. Um, so from an abolitionist perspective, um, all incarceration is um, at very least problematic. Um, um, but that depends on who you ask, Mr. Goss. <laughs> okay, uh, my, my next question is, you, you part of your earlier uh, lecture was had to do with submitting to authority and compliance. And I'm, I'm, I'm referencing a recent incident of a, a young, a nine-year-old girl in New York uh, that was, she was crying for her dad or whatever. And, and the police, uh, they were trying to get her in a car and they pepper sprayed her and they went, went way over as far as trying to uh, I guess, get this girl to comply. So at, at, at what level of authority, what level of authority requires compliance? I mean, do we uh, not comply with any authority or, I mean, where, where, where do we draw the line? Right. Um, so the, the abolitionist idea, particularly in terms of things like intentional communities, um, is that any authority that's vertical is problematic. Um, so um, to have autonomy um, over your own life and to have shared autonomy with folks in your communities um, is a necessary part of just being part of a society, right? That there has to be a level of agreement in terms of our norms, our structures, our institutions, our culture, et cetera, um, for us to sort of function. Um, the problem is when we rely on compliance to those norms rather than consensus to those norms. Um, and so our broader social structure, even moving beyond the criminal justice system, but most certainly the criminal justice system is almost wholly um, wrapped around compliance, right? And so the idea is that it doesn't matter whether or not you consent to your treatment um, uh, in terms of the criminal justice system, the law or whoever else. Um, um, it only matters that you are complying with the formal rationality of our legal structure. Um, and 
what we've seen, I think, through history is that that formal rational structure has was literally created to protect the supremacy of white landed elite men. Um, and so that means that everybody else um, is at a disproportionate negative impact to that same structure. Um, so if, if who do we submit to? No one, um, no individual. Um, we submit to the will of the community, but even submission is a kind of white supremacist, masculinist um, sort of terminology that an intentional community, an abolitionist community, uh, it would be unnecessary. We would instead be linked to each other in terms of mutual aid, consensus. I do what's necessary for my community because it's necessary for my community. Um, there's no need to steal a Snickers bar because I have food on my table. Um, um, the, that, that, that's basic level. Instead, what the criminal justice system does and broader systems of control, which is all of our social systems, is impose compliance from the top down instead of getting a mutual consensus about what we should comply to from the ground up. Thank you. So, okay. Mr. Goss, I know you said you had you know, a series of questions. <laughs> yeah, We're going to try to share the floor, sir. Uh, we have some <laughs> other questions. That I, I, I suspect that you have uh, Professor Goss's uh, personal contact information. I invite you to take it up in another form, sir, if you don't mind. All right. Um, I do want to bring attention to the fact that our great partners at Auburn Avenue yeah. have been filling the chat window with all kinds of resources in real time as we, as we talk about different ideas and authors. Uh, we have a question from uh, one of the students who's actually enrolled in this course uh, at Georgia State University, which is paired with all of these wonderful lectures from Barbara Boone. Good evening, uh, uh, Barbara Boone. And she asks, do you think the higher rate of police abuse to the disabled is linked to ideas related to eugenics? Well, I can address that first and I'll allow uh, Dr. Goss to talk about it. So I do think I mean, you, you think about perception, right? So when you think about intersectionality and all the things that um, affect the development of, a, of an identity, um, you can't deny the context, the history, you know? Um, so eugenics plays a huge role in how the whole society perceives people with disabilities, right? Not just police officers, um, but definitely gives police officers the idea that, um, you know, uh, your life might not matter as much. Um, I, I, you know, I think that's something that um, you know, we can talk about when we talk about, you know, Black Lives Matter and, and lives mattering. What does that mean when lives matter? Um, and I, the concept of eugenics is lives unmattering. So um, I do think there's a correlation. Um, you know, I, I can't sit here and, you know, tell you where that correlation began or where it, you know, the impact is greatest. Um, but um, you, Dr. Goss, you probably have a, a historical context around eugenics and um, how it might, uh, you know, uh, show up today. The effects of eugenics might show up today. Thank you. Absolutely, um, that's a, a great question. And um, I think that the, the simple and easy answer is yes. Um, now, I think like Ashley said, mapping that in terms of a kind of chronological movement would be uh, a whole other project, but um, an important one, but maybe perhaps when we don't have the time and resources to do at this moment, but um, I think theoretically, um, we can at least um, understand that the notion of eugenics, which has disproportionately been um, used, uh, um, uh, let's say, to, um, to terrorize, to victimize people with disabilities, certainly plays into the ways in which the state continues to control and terrorize people with disabilities. And so they're necessarily linked. Um, if we go back to the period of institutionalization, not that it's necessarily completely over, um, but the period in which um, the state was, let's say, more interested in institutionalizing people with disabilities, um, forced sterilizations was a common practice. Um, um, it was almost assumed. And, and the idea, of course, was eugenic, um, that we didn't want people with disabilities to reproduce um, lest they reproduce more people with disabilities. Right. Um, there were instances, for example, where um, um, people 
who uh, social workers would go into people's homes, um, particularly um, uh, folks living through poverty, um, to make different kinds of determinations about what kinds of government subsidy they would be allowed to have. Um, and two things were always flagged. One, if you had a promiscuous daughter, right? Um, that was a problem. And two, if you had children with disabilities. Um, and so in both of those flags, um, the suggestion was often sterilization. Right. Um, um, if you're, we don't want people with disabilities reproducing, and we don't want poor people reproducing. And beyond, and, and just by the way, the the eugenic movement in the U.S. is very recent. Um, I know states like North Carolina were doing it up until the 1970s. Um, so the the idea of eugenics is certainly. Um, expressed in the ways in which the state has historically controlled and terrorized um, the, 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 the bodies of people with disabilities. Um, and I don't think it's a huge leap to think about the police um, in, a, in a similar circumstance, since they are the primary mode of social control um, um, in terms of the state today. Thank you for that. Um, both of you. So we have a colleague, a question from my colleague, and really the 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 brain behind uh, the Freedom Schools, Lakita Burnett Bailey, and she she asked this question: Can you talk more about mental health and the way in which it's stigmatized and marginalized in our community, in the Black community, and the relationship between you know, compassion and empathy? Do you expect changing views on Black mental illness within the community? What are your thoughts on that? Yeah, um, so more about mental health as and disability is stigmatized, marginalized in the Black community. So yeah, so mental health in general carries a stigma, right? And I often, so I, I remember writing up about this, like the, the myth of the angry Black woman, right? Mm -hmm. The idea that we're angry just because we're angry, you know, but this is centuries of trauma, you know, generations of trauma. Um, and I think a lot of the times the Band-Aid is, you know, pray about it, you know, in our community or, um, you know, just carry on. This is just what you got to deal with, um, you know, and then we think about black males and help seeking behavior. Um, and it's just, it's just really, it's, 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 it's not the best, you know, um, and, and this is as suicide attempts and suicide rates among our community are rising, you know, and so I do, I do think this dis destigmatization of mental health in general is, is a huge, um, well, the stigma in general is a barrier, you know, and destigmatization could definitely help relieve some of those barriers. And then when you think about disability on top of that, um, a lot of intellectual and developmental disabilities come with co-occurring mental health issues, right? And oftentimes um, when you talk about getting care and supports for people with intellectual and developmental disabilities with co-occurring mental health illnesses, um, it's hard. So you, the way you know um, states are set up with the way they allocate care, um, a person with autism has a certain set of care, then a person with a mental health uh, illness has a certain set of care. So somebody who exhibits both gets no care. <laughs> so it's like, and then we already talk about how identifying black people with autism there's a huge disparity in just identifying them. And we, uh, black people with autism or intellectual, other intellectual and developmental disabilities get identified late. And we know that is, you know, get, getting identified early is, is, a, is, a, is a crux um, with dealing with intellectual and developmental disabilities and um, the outcomes in adulthood. So this, uh, this stigma um, definitely enhances the problems uh, that people with disabilities uh, have especially um, intellectual and developmental disabilities. So I hope that answered your question. Yeah, for sure. I would, um, I think that, here's what I'm saying. I think that the mental health stigma argument in black communities is often overstated. Um, and I don't mean that it doesn't exist certainly exist. I, what I mean is that I think Black folks are more likely to recognize that their mental health struggles are structural. Um, mm -hmm. I think that the, the, the way in which mental health has been framed in terms of whiteness has detached 
psychology from social structure, right? Um, the institutions that we have to survive, the cultures that we have to survive. I think black people are more likely to understand that I'm stressed out because poverty, <laughs> you know? Um, and so then it's like, why do I, why would I go see a therapist unless they're gonna pay my rent? Um, and when somebody says that to me, I can't be like, oh, that's not the way to think about mental health. No, that, that makes complete sense. So in, in some ways, I think the ways in which we talk about the stigma of mental health in black communities, um, it, it's, it's a harm reduction and it's an important conversation to have. Um, but in a way it's sort of a performance um, because um, I think we're, we're hard pressed to find some issue, whatever it may be, even if it's not health related, that doesn't go back into the ways in which the structures that we have to live through as black people are oppressive. Um, um, so and to add to that all, you know, other kinds of uh, um, identity formations that are also oppressed, uh, but all of that is structural. And so um, I'm, I'm careful, I'm, I'm increasingly careful when I have this conversation about uh, black folks mental health and particularly in terms of black masculinity um, because I don't want to say to someone who is um, trying to decide if they're going to you know eat today or pay their rent that oh well you should go pay for a therapist instead um, that's just nonsensical to me um, um, and I don't think it really fits that sort of you know Maslow hierarchy of needs we've got to really get this lower place settled first. Um, and so um, I, I think too often uh, we have this conversation about black mental health and um, it, 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 it has this air of victim blame um, only because it, I think it too often doesn't really incorporate a structural analysis, um, which is a problem. I, I do think it's changing. I've seen uh, publications come out um, uh, there was one whole book, I don't think it was necessarily race related, I can't remember what it was, but the author was essentially arguing that like all of these psychological illnesses that are really prevalent um, in our society today are, we can trace directly back to something structural. Um, I don't remember the title, but um, it was really interesting. Um, but in terms of harm reduction, I do see a lot more black people um, uh, talking to each other about mental illness in a way that's not just pray about it. <laughs> that's not helpful either. Um, it's just like one meme that I love, or uh, it's like a, a tweet, uh, and, uh, like a black guy, he, was, he said that he like went to uh, his therapist and he saw his friend there and his friend was like, bro, you're sad too? Uh, you know, and I thought it was really endearing. It was really cute. And, and even though it was sort of trite as a, as a tweet, I think it does speak to a, a movement to destigmatize um, um, mental health in our community, which is important. But all the while we have to remember structure first, right? Um, um, structure first. So we have we have a, a few more for a few more minutes. And Desmond, I, I have to I have to ask this question. I just I have to ask. So as you know, um, hashtag the state way, you know, Georgia State has been engaged in a number of efforts around becoming a more diverse, equitable, and in inclusive institution. And there are rumors that I was involved in some of those efforts. Um, I, you know, I can remember Derek Bell's argument related to interest convergence, specifically around integration and uh, the anniversary of the Brown v. Board decisions. It's a brilliant book, highly recommend it. And your distinctions between reformist and liberalist strategies and abolitionist strategies and the way in which uh, the former ultimately served the institution. Um, so I, I need to shut up and ask the question. You know, I'm an academic. That's what we do. We make these <laughs> question statement, statement questions. But in, 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 in considering my own hesitance to become involved in those efforts, to be quite frank, um, Many of those questions, uh, I, I felt those questions being whispered in my ear by by that inner voice. So I wanted to ask you, and both of you, uh, to be fair, thank you, Ashley. Um, just in terms of Georgia State's reputation as a diverse institution, as an innovative institution, um, 
um, and Georgia State's response ongoing, as it may be Presidential Commission on Next Generation Faculty Task Force, et cetera, et cetera. I wanted to give you a chance to, to speak to some of these themes as it relates to your reflections on what it is that Georgia State has attempted to do and is doing in this space. That's a great question. I think that what I like to do with this question is separate problematically, but um, for the entrance of self-preservation, separate yeah. Georgia State as an institution um, and the people of Georgia State. Yeah. Um, um, so the people of Georgia State are, in my opinion, some of the most social justice oriented people, at least in academia, that I've ever met, um, particularly people of color, um, queer folks, trans folks, folks with disabilities, um, um, folks with family members that are undocumented, etc. Um, Georgia State as an institution is a corporation. So we shouldn't, I mean, I wouldn't expect ExxonMobil to not dump a bunch of oil in the Gulf. Uh, so I'm not really sure I expect GSU as an institution um, to enact social justice. And I mean, just look at its history, right? I mean, it is a, uh, a, a university that was literally built on top of one of the last remaining black centers of commerce. Um, it, it was built in tandem with the highway system, literally to service white communities who had been themselves serviced by suburban suburbanization. Um, it was a whites only institution um, until not that far back in time. Um, and if we even just scoop forward to um, the ways in which Georgia State has participated in continuing to gentrify, um, particularly in terms of the Turner Field area, other areas that have been historically um, black, low income areas, um, I, I don't trust that Georgia State as an institution, that the, the DEI that it engages in is in the interests of social justice. I believe like all corporations, um, it is self-interested. Um, that being said, no institutional is eternal or static. Um, I think right now there are masses of people at Georgia State pushing GSU to be better and better and better. Um, um, I think these people are putting their own careers and livelihoods on the line. They are using a lot of their own time and resources and energy and not getting any institutional credit for doing so. Um, and they are heroes really in this movement in order to, to redirect the enormous um, resources of Georgia State towards helping communities instead of self-preservation. Um, but GSU is not alone either. I mean, um, this it is uh, uh, an, an institution that markets on diversity like so many other institutions. Um, it is an institution that is embroiled right now in a move of DEI, uh, like so many other institutions. Um, and you know, I, I remember vividly the moment I saw Black Lives Matter on Amazon Prime, and and for me that was just like I don't I don't I think I just sat there and, and looked for a minute, like how in the world um, could Amazon have the gumption? Um, to say Black Lives Matter. Like, I don't even, where do we even start? Do we start with climate? Do we start with <laughs> uh, anti-unionization? Where do we start, you know? And so um, we have to be really vigilant, I think, to keep imagining a world that we wanna live in. Um, because the world that we live in now will always try to limit that imagination and say, well, you want social justice, here's diversity. But I don't, I don't want a black oppressor any more than I want a white oppressor. Um, I want to be unoppressed. Um, and that means that we got to move beyond DEI. We've already done this, right? We, we, we've, we've done this several times. Um, just having faces of color does not bring about social justice. In fact, 
we it may make it more difficult to really understand the depths of that oppression, right? Oh, President Obama. I'm not going to go any more detail than that because my dad's on it. He doesn't like that. Uh, but that's a great example, right? And so um, I have hope in GSU because of the people. Um, um, I, I, and I work there, you know, and I enjoy my job. Please don't fire every GSU. Um, but I also understand that GSU is at heart um, a neoliberal institution and neoliberal institutions will do what they need to survive. Um, and if that means in this moment in time incorporating, um, you know, queer faces, faces of color, women, et cetera, then, then so be it. Uh, but that means nothing without support, right? Um, that means nothing without challenging the actual structures um, that creates uh, supremacy in the first place. And um, that's what I wanna see from our incoming president. That's what I wanna see um, from everyone who has a vested interest in GSU. Thank you. Um, Ashley, before we go to you, and don't forget, uh, Desmond, we're, we're hiring a new vice president for DEI coming up. So just, okay, just um, <laughs> Ashley, any thoughts on that? Yeah, so I, when I think about this question, um, you know, I have a, a background in biostatistics um, in public health, and I, I come from a disparities perspective, you know, so you can think about public health and even the advent of public health was to address disparities, right? So we've known since the beginning of public health that there were disparities, and we've been on this chase, this kind of wild goose chase of uh, you know, decreasing disparities, you know, and now we've kind of changed the narrative to eliminating these disparities, right? So um, when we talk about eliminating disparities, you know, I, I, I think of everything from a, a data perspective. So like, if we really affect policy, we have, have data that shines a light on stories that are untold, right? These unsung stories. So too often we have survey data that doesn't collect race or ethnicity information, doesn't collect disability status information, doesn't collect sexuality um, information. Um, so it's very lacking, right? And I, I think about, um, I know this is kind of a far-fetched example, but going back to like patents, in order for you to get a patent, you didn't have to put your race on there unless you were black. So it's like, you think about how these disparities began, it's because, again, talk back to Dr. Goss, like there's structural, there's a structural issue here, you know? Um, and I do feel like Georgia State and the scholarly work we do, you know, there's also, there's always grants talking about, let's examine the disparities, let's examine the disparities, you know, but it only goes as far as the grant dollars go, you know? And, you know, you get your, your line item on your CV, you know, you get your name on a, uh, a website, you know, next to some cool initiatives, but there's no real reallocation of research dollars really to explore this phenomenon of racism, right? So we've seen in a, a, a number of states racism be deemed a public health issue because of COVID-19. You just can't unsee this, you know? So um, when we start really addressing things in truth, you know, speaking to things as they are, um, as opposed to how, you know, people, you know, we, we get, we, we gotta stop coddling uh, white people's feelings. Mm -hmm. And I think that's the issue here. Um, people don't wanna be called a racist, you know, even though this, these are the waters in which we swim, you know, um, people don't wanna give up something they have, even though uh, it was black labor and lives and blood that, you know, gave a lot of people the things that they do have, you know, so, um, you know, I, th I think there's so much going on. It's an interconnected web um, of, of, of research dollars, of, um, you know, neo, what, <laughs> neo-colonialism institutions, mm, right. <laughs> um, all these things, so. Thank you. Thank you for that. And, and we're over a little bit, and I want to thank you all for a phenomenal um, freedom School session, and I want to thank you both for speaking truth to power in in a number of different ways in your scholarship, in your work at Georgia State, work on committees, etc.
Um, and, you know, you are not alone in that regard. And, and we really, really appreciate this session. It was dynamic, important, expansive, and it provided us with some very important perspectives on, on Black life that we have not yet to this point addressed in the series. So thank you for that. And I want to thank Arvin Avenue as always. And I want to invite you next week for um, a talk by our good friend and colleague who is the director of the Women's Gender and Sexuality Studies Institute here at Georgia State, Stephanie Evans, who will be presenting her, her book talk on her forthcoming book, phenomenal book, Peace and Freedom, Black Women's Yoga and Health History. So we'll see you here next Wednesday at 7.15. Thank you, Ashley. Thank you, Desmond. Thank you, Arvin Avenue Research Library. Thank you, uh, Mr. Goss. For, for joining in. And of course, thank all of you for tuning in and we appreciate you and take care, be safe.